So this video is going to be a overview of how vaccines work, um, how the coronavirus actually works and infects your body, um, how the coronavirus vaccines work, and then a bit about um, vaccines in general at the end, and um, how the coronavirus vaccines have been developed so quickly. So in order for your body to actually fight off an infection, it needs to work out exactly what it is. And it does this by recognising specific proteins on the outside of the bug um, called antigens. And these antigens are specific to each type of bug, whether that be a virus or a bacteria like coronavirus or something else. Um, each individual bug has its own type of antigen, which is specific. It's a bit like its ID badge. And this is what the body uses to recognise what the invading bug is. So in the case of coronavirus, this antigen is called a spike protein. And this spike protein is what coronavirus uses to get into your cells. Just a little aside, so um, coronavirus is called that because the little spike proteins on the outside of it, which you can see under a microscope, um, make the virus itself look a bit like a crown. So once your body has worked out exactly what type of bug it is that's invading, it can then find the right type of cells to destroy it. So there are trillions of different variations of these cells, so this can take quite a long time to work out which ones are best. Um, and so some of these immune cells work by killing the cell which the virus has infected along with the virus inside and some of them um, release things called antibodies which stick to the spike proteins on the outside of the coronavirus and make them easier to gobble up and can stop them getting into the cells in the first place. Once the infection has been eliminated, um, some of these cells which have used to fight the infection will stick around in the body and they're called memory cells. They remember exactly what sort of infection it was and how to respond to it. So if you ever get the infection again, um, you can respond to it really, really quickly and don't get a full infection. In the case of the coronavirus, the antibodies will stick to the spike protein and prevent them getting into the cells in the first place. So the overall effects of this is that the infection will cause almost no damage itself and the body's immune response won't be so huge that it ends up damage it, damaging the body's own cells. So a bit about the COVID infection itself. So the COVID infection is a coronavirus. Um, it's a virus, which means it's not technically living, but it has to use um, other organism cells in order to make all the things that it needs. So. What it does is it uses the spike proteins to get inside the host cells, human cells, and then it tells the human cells to make all the proteins and things that it needs. And it does this via its set of instructions called RNA. Now, human cells have their own RNA, but in human cells, this is only used to copy instructions from the main instruction book, the DNA, and then take that to the protein factories called ribosomes. Now with coronavirus, it just goes straight in there. The RNA tells the protein factor factories to make all the proteins it needs um, to make new viruses. And once it's got everything it needs, the human cell will explode and infect all the surrounding cells with more coronavirus. So, the Pfizer vaccine. This is the first vaccine to be licensed here in the UK and it is based on this system. So what happens is that a piece of RNA, which is the instructions for the spike protein, is introduced into the human cells so the human cells make the spike protein. Um, the body then recognises this spike protein as foreign and mounts a small immune response towards it. It will produce the specific cells needed to destroy the spike protein. Um, and then these cells and antibodies will hang around in the body. And then if you ever get infected with the real coronavirus, um, the body will know what to do straight away and will produce the cells and antibodies to stop you getting a full-blown infection. So the Oxford vaccine works a bit differently and it's more of a traditional vaccine. So the Oxford vaccine uses a different type of virus which often infects chimpanzees and it weakens it so it can't cause any damage 
and then modifies it to make it look like the coronavirus by adding spike proteins and then the rest of it is a similar concept so the body reacts to the spike protein and then those cells stick around and remember it for next time. So now for the MMR scandal. So if you didn't know, the MMR scandal um, started in around 2000 after a paper released in 1998 in The Lancet by a guy called Andrew Wakefield um, claimed that the MMR vaccine, which vaccinates against measles, mumps and rubella, caused autism. The study was right at the bottom of the list in terms of um, evidence quality and it was only made up of 12 trial participants. And the study was done with the intention of creating evidence for a legal trial which was going on. And someone had paid um, Andrew Wakefield a huge amount of money to produce some evidence which he could then use in the trial. The, the trial is completely untrustworthy. There have since been numerous epidemiological studies all over the world involving thousands and thousands of people proving that the MMR vaccine does not cause autism. This was one greedy, selfish man who wanted fame and fortune at the expense of lives all over the world. And it contributed significantly to the anti-vax movement and the reduction of, in uptake of vaccines. The paper has since been removed. Um, Andrew Wakefield has been struck off the medical register, so he's no longer a doctor. And all the other authors on the paper have since withdrawn their support for it. So you may be wondering how the COVID vaccines were developed so quickly um, and a lot of people are sceptical about this. So normally the scientists who develop these vaccines have huge financial, administrative and logistical barriers to getting vaccines made and actually developing anything. They need funding, they need permission, they need lab space, they need administrative staff, trial participants, other human resources and many other things in order to develop a vaccine and all of these take time and often one thing can't be completed until something else is done and each thing takes a lot of time. Since the start of the pandemic a lot of the scientific community and governments and corporations internationally have had one focus and that is to develop a safe and effective vaccine as quickly as possible. Um, that means all of these barriers have been significantly reduced and lots more scientists who wouldn't have been working on a specific vaccine are now all working together with one common goal. Additionally, it's a lot easier to find trial participants when the coronavirus has had such a big impact on everyone's lives because people want to help to try and bring back some normality in the future. This means that the scientists are just left to their devices to create a safe and effective vaccine as quickly as possible. And what's more, since the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, uh, a few years ago, the scientific community has been working on a way to develop a vaccine as quickly as possible. And this way, this was almost finished at the start of the, pan of the coronavirus pandemic. So they already had a head start on creating a vaccine quickly. The vaccines wouldn't be allowed to be used and wouldn't get approval if they weren't completely safe, there was nothing to worry about. And that's broadly speaking how the vaccine was developed so quickly. So thank you for watching this video, um, I hope you found it useful and if you've made it this far, well done. Um, if you think your friends will find it useful, please share it with them.